Good morning, my friends. Thank you all for coming. For those who do not know me, my name is Meng. For those who know me, my name is still Meng. <laughs> the reason I told this joke is about, I don't know, many years ago, yes. 2007 or something, back when even I was young, yeah, we, we did this together. I, I told this Same joke. Jokes. Yeah, I told this joke. He still remembers, so which is why uh, I told this joke again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're very funny together. Uh, I think the last joke we told to each other was just now. So we talked about changing the world. And he says, yeah, because of you, the North and South are switched. And I said, no, North and South Pole are still the same. East and West Pole, different. Okay. That's a very good one. Huh? <laughs> good one. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you all know Matthew as the happiest man in the world. But uh, every time you say that, Matthew gets embarrassed. So please don't say that. Please do not say, Matthew Ricard is the happiest man in the world. <laughs> I repeat, do not say, Matthew Ricard is the happiest man in the world. Don't think of a white bear. <laughs> don't think of the white bear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, jokes aside, uh, I'm so happy to have you, my dear friend. Matthew is, in my opinion, a true gem in this world. Okay, it's getting worse and worse. Now. It's getting worse, right? <laughs> By the way, the email I send them out, I call you a saint. So, <laughs> Nice time to retire. <laughs> He's a gem uh, uh, for many reasons. I think one of the big reasons is because he is the best person who is bridging East and West. The best of ancient wisdom, Eastern wisdom, with the best of Western science. Because he, uh, he has a PhD in micromolecular genetics under a Nobel laureate, uh, 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 Francois, yes, yes, I, I almost got it. Uh, and after his PhD, he decided to become a monk. Uh, not immediately, but not immediately. Yeah. So when I grow up, I will be a monk, and then he did. <laughs> and then um, he was under the tutelage of at least two Tibetan masters, two great masters, uh, Kangu Rinpoche and uh, Dilgo Kensi Rinpoche. Yes. Uh, and he has sixty thousand hours of meditation training right now, thereabouts. Give or take ten thousand. <laughs> yeah, what's 10,000 hours between friends, right? <laughs> and, and when Matthew was, uh, I think you were the first person ever to be in a, a first person with 10,000 hours of meditation ever to be in an fMRI machine. Maybe. You could be the longest person, I mean, the person who has spent the longest time in the fMRI machine. That's possible. Yes, contributed greatly to science and to, uh, because he speaks the language of East and West, he speaks French, he speaks English, he speaks science, and he speaks Tibetan. And... He speaks wisdom. He's everything. Yeah. And on top of that, Matthew is a humanitarian leader, tireless, working for the world, trying to, trying to feed hungry people, teach the illiterate. And on top of that, uh, in person, if you ever have an unrealistic expectation about what a holy man should be like, unrealistic, unreasonable, he meets those expectations. He's spoiling the market for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it's, it's it. wonderful to have you, Thank you. and uh, in this world, Thank you. and in Google. <laughs> and my friends, please welcome Matthew Ricard. Thank you. Thank you. First, thank you so much to everyone here at Google. I'm so happy to be here for the, back for the first, third time. And since Meg likes to make the same jokes, you know, 10 years interval, I recall also that last time he said that since Google didn't exist in 1967 when I first went to India, you know, so besides entering Google, the next best thing I could do is to spend 45 years in the Himalayas. <laughs> so I'm very happy to be back. Last time was a talk on happiness. I find happiness pretty boring. And especially because uh, the risk is that we try to look for selfish happiness, which is not only boring, but which is a recipe for failure. And I want to say why, because you know, there are people who, you know, smart philosophers who make big statements. We are, as sentient beings, our main goal is to live the full span of our life. I mean, for those who find taste in life. They say, okay, good. And therefore, during this life, we are entitled to look for well-being and flourishing and happiness. Well, great, that sounds okay, so far. Therefore, we should be selfish. You know, big logical and experiential mistake. The idea that, well, you know, if you really want to survive, really want to be happy, everyone for themselves, and we have a good chance to achieve that. Why is that fundamentally flawed? First of all, 
on the purely experiential aspect. Now, if you think someone who's thinking me, me, me all day long, it's a very miserable situation because you feel so vulnerable. Anything that will be you know, said in terms of praise or blame or gain or loss, the whole world becomes either a potential threat or some kind of instrument that you hope to use uh, to maximize that selfish happiness. So then it's a completely you know, uh, unbalanced situation. The world is not a mail order catalog for your desire, your fancies, your hopes and fears. Plus, on, to on top of that, within the bubble of self-centeredness, you know, it's pretty stuffy to live in that bubble. And everything takes a huge proportion. You know, it's like a storm in a glass of water. And everything that happens unsettles you. you know, if you put a handful of salt in this glass, it's undrinkable. Put it in a big lake, no big deal. Put it in the ocean, you won't even notice the difference. So a very narrow mind of me, me, me is not very pleasant. And of course, you will be a pain to everyone, every, almost everyone else around you. But the other reason is why it doesn't work, is even, as I would say, deeper, is basically because it, it puts you at odds with reality. Now, you would assume, maybe I don't have anything against others, but it's not my job, so let's try to build my happiness in that little bubble. It's easier. You know, it's only about my happiness, so not about everyone's happiness. How can I think of that? So I have nothing against others being happy, but that's not my, it's not my job. So that supposes that we could function as an independent bubble, and we would be a, some kind of separate entity from the rest of the world, of reality. But if you look at the white sheet of paper, the, the first thing you could write on it is others, 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 others. I have a friend who teaches at Harvard, Greg Norris. He studies you know, how, what, how many things are implicated in producing like a white sheet of paper. 13 nations. You know, a white sheet of paper in France, white one. There's wood come from Finland. The stars of potato come from Czechoslovakia. And then, of course, the guy in Finland had the whole history with his grandparents and everything. So the, suddenly, the whole thing, others, 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 are present in everything. So our happiness, our suffering are so intimately intermingled through this interdependence. So the idea that we could function as a separate entity is bound to misfunction. Now, if you look experientially at the state of mind that is you know, full of warm-heartedness, you know, benevolence, kindness, consideration, care, empathy, altruistic love, wishing everyone happiness, compassion, that means the wish that they may cease to suffer when they suffer. So these are kind of the most uh, fulfilling states of mind. You know, we remember a particularly fulfilling time in our life is usually a time of unconditional love for a child or for someone. You know, even the founders of positive psychology like Barbara Fredrickson called you know, love in the sense of positive resonance with others the supreme emotion because that's the, among all positive emotions the one that broadens more your perspective, your way of seeing others. So at first it feels good and of course if you are a warm-hearted person people usually like it. Even dogs will, will like to stay next, next to you. So they will sort of sense that you are a good, a nice person to be with. And then it's also functional. Why? Because then it is attuned to the interdependence. You know, if you realize what, that when you wake up in the morning, I don't want to suffer the whole day and if possible my whole life. And then it's not very difficult to put yourself in someone's mind and say even that person is confused, doing exactly the opposite what that person should do to find well-being, but still basically do not want to suffer. So then that common humanity, that common sentience, I would say, with other sentient beings like animals, create this feeling of interdependence, of common sort of wish to escape suffering and find flourishing. And therefore, if you value your own wish for happiness, how can you not value and therefore be concerned, at least not neglect or disregard or use in an in instrumental way that wish of others to escape suffering and be happy. So on the individual level, you know, I think the pursuit of selfish happiness doesn't work. The other one is bound to succeed. But now if we take the little bit global picture to see why this notion of altruism is something more than a kind of noble utopia, some kind of luxury that we could afford when everything goes well. And people say, you know, at times of catastrophe, and 
And actually, we could see in Nepal, like in every major catastrophe of any kind, how the first thing that happened after the initial shock of whatever might be a bomb or, in that case, an earthquake, how people got calm, organized, incredible solidarity, helping each other, you know, bringing people to hospital. Most of the work is done by local population. The rescuers, they come and help with dogs and stuff like that. But 95% of all that work is not about looting. It's not about doing terrible things. It is always and again and again the same pattern that occurs. So there's a hope that we have that within ourselves and we can enhance that. So why in the global picture is it so important? So if you think of the situation of the world, we are often in our days kind of being on the edge. And we could be in our own life. You know, we have to deal with our mind to begin with from morning till evening. And that mind can be your best friend or your worst enemy. I mean, when people suffer terribly in, within themselves, even they are sort of living in a little paradise, it's the, pro it's the working of the mind. Those rumination, hope and fear that leads to depression, to despair, it's the mind made. And then you can see people who are keep their joy of living even in the face of seemingly very adverse circumstances. So the power of the mind, it's not that we should neglect outer condition. I'm the last one who would say that because I try to dedicate at least a good part of my life to, you know, we helped 41,000 people for over last month in the earthquake area of 160 village. So the idea of remaining to poverty, to whatever we could do to improve outer condition, that's for granted. But at the same time, we tend to neglect the inner condition for flourishing. And I, I'm fundamentally convinced that altruistic love is one of the main contributors of that cluster of human quality that leads to well-being and flourishing. But there is challenges. There are challenges in, the, in society. You know, there are plenty of people who live in poverty in the midst of plenty. And then, so we have you know, all these challenges in our lives. But if we look at those challenges, basically one of the most serious ones in our times is the difficulty we have to reconcile three time scales. There is the short term of the economy. Of course, economists say we are making 10 years, 20 years plan, but nobody will buy bonds that will mature in 100 years. And basically, if it's not the next one day to the other coming and going up of the stock market, it's the end of the month, the end of the year, balance sheet, that's what matters. If you tell to economists you should be altruistic, that's great, but it's not what economy is about. So there is this question of the short term. And people say, you know, if the economy flourishes, everything else will go along, you know, as a sort of byproduct. But the fact is, you could be in the most powerful and richest nation and still people, if people feel miserable, what's the point? So the idea that happiness will come out of GDP, you know, has been already shown to be just a fallacy. It doesn't work like that. Then we have the mid-term in terms of time frame. That is what? That is your life. That is a, you know, a career, a family, a generation, your lifetime. So how do you measure that satisfaction or that sense of fulfillment or accomplishment? First of all is what is the quality of life moment after moment? How do you experience at the working place when you study, when you engage with others? What do you see deep within? Sadness, sort of despair, or kind of joy to do what you do? And then, if you look at 10 years, how rewarding was that? How fulfilling was that? I remember when I was doing the book on happiness, meeting someone in Hong Kong, who said, you know, 20 years ago, I wanted to uh, get a million dollars, and I've got 10, and I wasted 20 years of my life. It's not that just the pursuit of that per se is wasting your life, but he found that it has no meaning for him. So then, so we need to get some kind of satisfaction in our life. That's obvious. Otherwise, what's the point going on? But then there's a new challenge. And of course, you guess what? It's the long term. And that new challenge is our impact on future generation. And that's new why. 10,000 years ago, there was one to five million people on Earth. You know, they could not do much damage. I mean, whatever they were doing, the Earth's resilience will repair that instantly. And then when came the industrial revolution, scientific technological revolution, giving us thousandfold more power to influence our environment. 
Now, nobody decided to sort of ransack the planet. This is not, therefore, we don't feel individually responsible. Plus, it certain time span. Plus, it's not really visible day after day. It's visible on the longer term. And we are equipped emotionally by evolution to react to immediate dangers. If I say there's a rhinoceros coming full speed from this door, everybody runs. If I say there will be a rhinoceros in 30 years, people say, so what? <laughs> so in the 60s, 70s, when the first data about global warming came out, those scientists went to the White House and they told the advisors, you know, in 50 years, going to be a real mess. So they were told, well, come back in 49 years, we'll see. <laughs> but that's not the way to proceed because 49 years will be much too late. The tipping points will have occurred. But, and then we don't see that happen. If a friend of mine who is a great environmentalist says, if the, C if the CO2 could be pink and we saw the sky becoming pinker every day, we would worry a little bit more. So it's hard to feed it in one's flesh, but yet it is absolutely true that no matter how complex scientifically, politically, economically the question of the environment is, it is a matter of selfishness versus altruism. You know, I'm a Marxist. Don't worry, the, not the Karl tendency, the Groucho tendency. <laughs> so Groucho said, why should I care for future generations? What did they do for me? <laughs> but unfortunately, I, I heard a serious version of it by a, a, a US billionaire saying on Fox News, and maybe you heard of that, Fox. He says about the rising of the oceans, you know, which is happening three millimeters every year, well, no matter what. He says, I find absurd to change my behavior now for something that will happen in 100 years. So, after me, never mind. So we won't be there in 100 years, maybe some of you if you live 120 or something. But, of course, there will be billions and billions of people who will say, you knew and yet you did nothing. So it's not a trivial matter. And people say, well, we'll adapt. Yes, of course, 200 million climate refugees, you know, wars because of that, terrible devastation, two, four, six degree increase, a complete upheaval on the planet. We might adapt but at the cost of how much suffering. So that's if we want, that's for, again, question of altruism versus selfishness. So now, you get environmentally speaking with economists. This is schizophrenic dialogue. They don't speak the same language because someone's telling 50 years you're going to get all that and they say, you know, I'm interested in the balance sheet at the end of the year. So what we need a common concept, at least to have a platform of discussion. You know, over the last 10 years, I've been going around meeting all kinds of wonderful people, psychologists, environmentalists, social workers, spiritual you know, men of wisdom and women of wisdom and compassion. I was seven times at the World Economic Forum, all kinds of weird place for Buddhist monks. <laughs> and yet, what the, the common thing, that only concept that emerged to that, and which I spent five or six years researching for this book, is a simple one having more consideration for others. It's no rocket science. If you have more consideration for others, which is the definition of altruism and intention and motivation to benefit others, full stop. Of course, we have other thoughts from time to time. There's no question about that. Selfishness does exist, but we do have moments where we do think in altruistic way. So if you have more consideration for others, for sure, you will have a more caring economics. That can remit it to two things that Homo economicus Maximizing self-personal preference cannot do. Poverty in the midst of plenty, the homo economicus will never resolve that question. And the common goods, quality of the air, of the atmosphere, of democracy, of you know, all these things that we can have in common, but you could easily be a free rider, do nothing for that and still benefit, but it needs to step out of maximizing personal interest to take care of the environment. So we need current economics. Then we need to work on gross national happiness. I mean, provide better conditions at the working place, in education, in transport, everything that makes a life that can be fulfilled. And then we need to care for future generations. So that concept at least allows people to come together and have a common platform for a better world. So to illustrate that, you know, we have this idea of you know, this limit here. And of course, if you say, well, let's go on using all the resources we have, now, at the current rate of increasing of using resources, by 2050, we'll need three planets. We don't have them. There's no, again, no, no rocket science. Still, people say, let's go on, let's go on, let's go on. So let's go on is like this president 
who about 10 years ago, spoken about this country, said five years ago, we are at the edge of the precipice, now we made a big step forward. So you see what happens if this guy <laughs> makes a big step forward. So that's called illimited material quantitative growth. It cannot work forever. So what does that line correspond to in terms of science? So here we go to what some scientists have defined as the planetary boundaries. So we are now in the, where well, we were in the Holocene, the period of exceptional climate stability for 12,000 years. It more or less ended in the 1950s entering the Anthropocene, the age of where human beings have the major impact on the planet. So in 1900s, we were well within the limit of safety, and safety means we could actually continue to prosper for another 50,000 years, most likely without big upheavals, if we were to keep those factors within the limits of safety. And you can see them, that's, that's what the main, most important, they are quite related, you know, if you increase CO2, you will increase the acidity of the ocean and so forth. Now, 1950 comes so-called the Great Acceleration. Some of those factors are looming now to be more looking like dangerous. Now, hold your breath, not too long, but imagine the next slide. And here we are. We vastly overgone some of the limit of safety. To give you one idea, very clear sort of picture of the loss of biodiversity. At the current rate today of losing species forever, it's not just diminishing or something, losing them. In 2050, we will have lost 30% of all species on Earth. And it will go on, of course, over 2050. That will be the sixth major extinction since the apparition of life on Earth, the fifth one being that of dinosaurs and many other species. So that's not a small thing. And everyone will be deeply affected, of course. So that's something that we cannot ignore. It's coming very soon. It will be your children, your grandchildren, and so forth. So what can we do about that? Well, we could sit like that, as I do in front of the Himalayas, waiting for the glaciers to melt. <laughs> but I've seen them melting over the last 45 years. People who have never heard of global warming, Tibetans and Nepalese says that, that they cannot only go for one month over the ice in the winter with their yaks, where they used to go for three months. So it's, again, very clear. Why? Because of this great acceleration. Here's the loss of biodiversity, of water use. And an interesting one is methane. You say, why methane? You know, methane now comes mostly from livestock. The use of livestock to, for meat production has become now the second major factor of greenhouse gas effect. That may seem strange, but that's the case. According to IPCC and FAO report, after the habitations and before transportation, before the cars, the planes, the ships, it is the whole chain of production for meat production. That may seem strange, but it is the case. 14% or 15% of that. And that's due mostly to methane emission besides deforestation and other things. So methane is 20 times more active than CO2 for greenhouse gas effect. And that shows because of this sort of extreme level of consumption. You know, 120 kilos of meat in the U in USA, 80 in Europe, only three in India per head per habitant per year. It's about, it's about seven in Africa. Luxembourg has the world record 137 kilos. We don't know exactly why. That, of course, comes at a price, a price, ethical price. There's about 65 billion land animals killed every year, a thousand billion, that's a trillion sea animals for our consumption. Ethical problem. But that's not, not only that. I mean, we do that in all kinds of ways. And is it because we are so selfish, because man is a wolf for man? Well, of course, some. First of all, wolves are quite nice sociable animals. You know, they are they're very rich social life. And the best friend of man, dog, it comes actually, as you know, from wolves. So it's not a very good comparison. But say, of course, there are people who manifest terrible cruelty. But the idea that we all like that, that's the big mistake. Is it, is it true? You know, look at these nice kids. It doesn't seem that it's that much of cruelty, at least potentially. And then we could also think that, you know, we are psychologically wired like that, like Freud would to think that we are all rascals. So if that was the case, you know, that's a good start in life, isn't it? But is it really the case? You know, I know this guy for quite some time. He doesn't look too bad, to me at least. So, and then if you look at people, you know, what is the greatest joy than, than to cooperate? You know, where I live in Bhutan and Nepal, like here in this Amish community in the United States, 
when times come to build a house, everybody comes. And not only you build a house, but it's an occasion of celebrating, of making a feast, of being together. And it's well known that you know, hunter-gatherers, the main factor of social life was an equalitarian cooperative community. And that's a great joy of doing that. And not only human beings do that. And someone said, please tell them there's no Photoshop in that. It's a real thing. <laughs> so then also we know, of course, there's a struggle for life, the survival of the fittest. <laughs> but yes, that is true. But if you read Darwin, first of all, the survival of the fittest is not Darwin's formula. It's Herbert Spencer, the bulldog of Darwin. And that led rise to social Darwinism, you know, like Enron type of competitions. But Darwin spoke so much more about cooperation. He, he even considered the possibility of extending benevolence to others than your kin and even to other species. That's very clearly expressed in Darwin. And I was really uh, inspired by discovering all that in Darwin's writing. In addition to that, the most recent trend in evolution, like works of Martin Novak at Harvard, the, the book Super Cooperators, of E.O. Wilson, who completely changed his views about that, is that yes, there is competition. Of course, we know that. I mean, there's no need to, root, to write a book in defense of selfishness or hurrah competition. But to show that, and that's what they have shown, that even though competition is doubtlessly exists, that cooperation has been much more creative throughout evolution to go from one step of complexity to another, from monocellular to multicellular to different kinds of symbiosis between animals up to social animals. So it is quite the case. And you know, there was a, a, a survey from the OCDE in the 36 or so developed countries proposing 10 factors that would contribute to well-being and asking people what they thought about it. You know, income came around rank number six. So of course, we matter for about income. Number one was quality of human relationship. That's what people said is makes the biggest difference to the quality of their life in their family, at work, in the social place, do we feel trust, do we feel safe, and so forth. So again, this is not only uh, you know, reserved to human beings, because you know, we got that through millions of years of evolution. If we have some quality, they didn't come out of the blue. And if you look at the hotspot for centuries in the world, you know, like there's one in Japan, they all tell you the reason we feel we live long is because from birth throughout life and up to death, we're always together. No one is left sort of abandoned somewhere in a corner. No, there are, I was surprised when doing the research on the book to find out that there are quite more people than I thought who uh, sort of thought, well, you know, basically whatever you do, scratch at the surface, at the, an, an altruist and the selfish will bleed. If you are very smart, you know, cynical enough, and you really look, you will find a selfish explanation for any seemingly altruistic behavior. So it's quite true that there are, you know, hypocritical behavior or just that you do something calculating what you're going to get in return. And you might, you know, make a big smile, make a present to someone to cheat them or even not, it's not that bad, but you could do just to boot your self-image or whatever, or just to relieve your empathic distress. You see someone suffering. You have no way out. It's not that much that you care about that wounded person, but since you have no way out, you help because you can't stand looking at that. You know, I see with animals, if you show terrible movies about animals, people say, oh, I love animals, I can't see that. Well, if you love animals, you know, just look at it and do something. So the idea of you do something to relieve your distress is not, particular, it's not fundamentally altruistic because you think of relieving your sort of tension. Yes, this being said, everyone who tried to find Selfish explanation for every human behavior has failed. This is armchair science. There's not a scientific, one single scientific study supporting the universal selfishness hypothesis. Rather the opposite, people like Daniel Batson spent 20 years devising skillful experiments in the lab in very nice control situation to put people in very specific situation to see the outcome of a choice. And there's always the significant people, even they have an easy escape, who choose the altruistic or what you call empathic concern uh, sort of solution. So he, his conclusion is after 20 years of research, the, we cannot prove 100% the altruistic hypothesis, but at least there's no support for the universal selfishness explanation. It's just simply ideology or just imagination. 
No, but just to tell you some, some of the arguments. They, they hear about someone you know, who did a very beautiful act of generosity, making a donation to save ten, 10 children anonymously, so nobody is there to praise him, he's not going to get his name in the newspaper, and so forth. But then he confides to a friend, you know, I felt so good doing that. And then you see when people work in our know, humanitarian activities, they spend one month with us, and at the end, you so they say, oh, I got more than I gave them. Some kind of, oh, so those uh, smart psychologists, uh, some, those who defend universal selfishness, they come and say, look, you did that for the warm glow. You know, you say you did all that and you feel so good and this, that's the thing that you take out of it. So you just did that to feel good. So is it, is it true all the time? So let's, let's look at this, uh, at this short movie. Okay, so you think this guy is saying, the one who jumped on the, on the rail track, I'm going to feel so good when that's over. <laughs> but that's not finished. Because then you interview those guys and they tell you know, of course I had to do that. I had no choice. Look, this guy was going to die. I jumped and took it off. And then those smart guys I come again and say, hey, hey, you had no choice. Automatic behavior, instinctive behavior. This is neither altruistic nor selfish. You just did it like that. What does that mean? You know, I, everyone I talk with, which is, is kind of a bit serious about that question, like Daniel Batson said, of course there's a choice. But that choice doesn't take long to deliberate. You know, it's like it comes from what you are, but it's not that you are believe, behaving like a robot. But look at this guy. You know, is he going to think for half an hour? Should I stretch my hand or not? Maybe if I break his little finger, the insurance company will sue me or something like that. <laughs> so there's a choice, but that choice takes a fraction of a second. So you may say, I had no choice because it was too obvious. And by the way, this guy had a choice. <laughs> Clear choice. Sorry, I don't have the next slide. I don't know what happened next. <laughs> now, people had choice. You know, in the Second World War, like in every persecution, genocide, there were people who took immense risk for themselves, for their family, over a long time. They were certainly not looking how to feel good and have the warm glow. There was terrible danger. This is the pastor Andre Trogme and his wife in the village of chambon sur lignon in Haute-Loire near the Swiss border in France. Over the years, they saved 3,500 Jewish persons. They never closed their door to anyone who sought help and refuge. They helped them to go through Switzerland. They were of a constant threat of deportation from the Gestapo. Even the Vichy French government was threatening them. They never made a concession. The whole village did that. And they certainly had the choice, and they did it. So rather than say, well, those are saints. No, this was a whole village. They were not born as saints. There's no Saint Jean, uh, Saint Jean or something like that. They say that is the most natural way to do. So instead of saying, oh, those are incredibly exceptional people, it's better to try to find that potential within ourselves, because we do have that potential. We do have the potential for care as this Chinese person who lost his two legs and all his life has been helping sick people and look with the kind of joy. So when you see someone with empathy, like this T woman uh, with bone TB that we help in Tibet, of course when you see that, or even worse, when you see the extreme form of, of, of deprivation, of, of starvation and so forth, now you feel a strong sort of emotional resonance, or you try to imagine yourself in the place of that person. That's called empathy. But empathy alone is not enough. Because what happens, you know, imagine you are a nurse or a doctor or social workers. I know someone working in this, with homeless in San Francisco. You know, if you day after day after day resonate with suffering of others, where neuroscience shows that you do suffer, this is real suffering in the brain. There's no question. So it may be too much asking to suffer for 20 years, morning, afternoon, and all the time. So you lead to burnout. And by the way, 60% of all medical personnel in the United States have or will suffer of burnout throughout their life. So is there a remedy to that? So we studied that with Tanya Singer. And of course, there is this burnout happening. With a neuroscientist, one of the world specialists of empathy, and she asked me to come in the, in the MRI, one of the 100 or 20 hours that I spent in the MRI machine. And she said, well, no, just do your meditation and we'll see what happens. 
So it was a special MRI called real-time fMRI. You can see immediately what's happened. You don't have to wait for, for weeks. And then after 10 minutes, she said to the mic, you know, what are you doing? This is nothing we see normally for empathy. I said, well, I'm meditating on compassion and loving kindness. This is, this is basically come out. We have to talk. You know, it's not the same areas of the brain. <laughs> So we talked, and he said, she said, well, she was a bit annoyed and because it was so different. And she said, could you do just empathy? You know, so I thought of, I well, said, okay, I can try. You know, push away your compassion. And <laughs> so when we explained that to the Dalai Lama, I said, how is it possible? And you, you see all these terrible things that don't have compassion. I said, well, we just try to focus on suffering and suffering only. So I saw, I've seen a documentary on the BBC the day before on Romanian orphans. It was so dramatic. In the, of, of those terrible movies, like when I was in London recently, I saw a photo exhibit on the Vietnam War. I mean, it's just, if you look at that for half an hour, you know, you fall quickly in empathic distress. So I tried for, for one hour doing that, and you know, in the MRI, you, do, you have to alternate to measure properly. So you do rest and then the state and then rest like 50 times. And after one hour, I was totally burned out. I mean, only resonating with the distress, I was feeling powerless almost like this guy, I didn't know how to deal with those terrible suffering, you know. It's all negative valence. And then at the end, it was about half, 1, 1, 11, 30 in the morning, Tanya said to the mic, would you like to take a break for lunch or would you like to move to your compassion meditation? I said, please let me do the compassion meditation. I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> so when I did that, it was like breaking open a dam, you know. I mean, like I felt that the outpour of sort of affection, embracing, like every atom of suffering was filled with an atom of love to the best. I, I felt much stronger actually in contrast with this empathic distress. And it was completely different, like day and night. And in the brain, of course, it was so different that we pursued the study with other subjects and eventually published a paper showing that the completely different network of the brain for empathy, empathic distress, and for loving kindness and compassion is a more positive sort of network of affiliation, maternal love, sense of, uh, of, of wholesomeness and, and reward, positive effect, applied to suffering in a constructive way. And now Stania has been doing a one-year program with 300 volunteers to distinguish those. She studied mindfulness, three months, perspective taking for three months, meta, which is loving kindness for three months, in different orders. And the preliminary results show that mindfulness is great to reduce stress, but it doesn't increase your prosocial behavior. Hence, we need caring mindfulness. You get two for the price of one, because to be caring, you need to be mindful, but you may not be necessarily caring by just being mindful. Imagine a mindful sniper, very mindful. He's always on the task, never distracted, no emotions, always non-judgmental in the present moment. <laughs> A mindful psychopath, same thing. But you can't have a caring sniper and a caring psychopath. So therefore, please add those six letters to any mindfulness meditation, caring mindfulness, and that will work out nicely. So anyway, the idea that it is loving kindness meditation that really increases prosocial behavior, and it is the antidote to burnout, because that very positive mental state applied to suffering it is basically altruism applied to suffering, compassion. That's kind of a bomb, a much bigger sort of thing than just empathy. You know, standalone empathy is like an electric pump without water, it burns. But if you add this very warm hearted feeling, it is actually the antidote to burnout. So that's why when you see very warm hearted doctors on this, naturally, people feel it so good and that can be trained, and that's the whole point of what we do. That certainly comes from maternal love or paternal, of, or paternal love, but we can use that to enhance it, to extend it to others. So now, very quickly, let's assume that altruism does exist. You know, if you look at the whole literature, I think it's pretty strong evidence. But you say, so what? You look at our world, the strong narcissistic epidemic and individualistic trends, and the world's not so going so, so well. Can we do something using that potential? So can we change individually? And can society change, societal change? So first, individually, this is Diego Kensirin Boucher, one of the Dalai Lama's teacher. I, I was fortunate to spend 13 years with him. My friend Vivian, who is here, also spent many years. My first teacher, Kangyur Rinpoche. And he's known as the Dalai Lama here with Richard Davidson, the neuroscientist from Madison. I think he came here, uh, who is very interested in 
uh, encouraging this collaboration. So now, then you got those who went to the lab, you know, studying with EEG, and he has Mingyur Rinpoche in the fMRI, and he characterized fMRI as being four characteristics. It is narrow, it is dark, it is noisy, and it is, what else? It, it is, it is uh, cold. So not very good place to meditate. <laughs> but nevertheless, you can try. <laughs> and then recently I was in the lab, a coma lab, in, uh, in, in, in Liège, in Belgium. It's world specialist on coma. He wanted to study different degrees of lucidity. So then they put me with an EEG, and there was something that called transmagnetic cranial stimulation that was pom, pom, pom for five hours, you know? <laughs> and then you have to meditate, you know? And then at some point, <laughs> on pure awareness, free from thoughts. <laughs> and then at some point, because I could not hear, because on top of that, they put you a white nose. And white nose is not just white like snow. It's like shh all the time. And then, of course, I can't hear any instructions, so they came with the board. Don't blink your eyes. So, <laughs> so I went like this. And then another board came. Relax your facial muscles. <laughs> Meditate. And then they said, could you self-induce a state of torpor? OK. <laughs> so I went really stupid. And then with all this, I'm being, being, being. And they said, could you fall asleep now? <laughs> well, after five hours, I managed to fall asleep. So anyway. So here I come out of the MRI after two and a half hours at uh, Richard Davidson's. And then you know what the result were, were with people with long-term meditation, there was huge differences. On the bottom, you see novice, not untrained people. You know, in, with the EEG, try to, trying to practice compassion meditation. You know, the pink line is when they rest, nothing much happened. The blue line is when they meditate, nothing much happened either. On top, the yellow line is the meditators at rest. If they rest, they rest. But when they engage in compassion meditation, you see this huge peak in the gamma rays of brain frequency that is so big that it was never observed before in neuroscience. And since I was the first guinea pig, that's crazy idea of the happiest person in the world came from a journalist who never thought of a better idea. <laughs> but it has nothing to do with happiness, and there are 7 billion beings. And by the way, all the 20 others, long-term meditators, did exactly the same, even better than me, so forget about that. <laughs> so now if you look at brain imaging, and you see on the, on the left side, the meditators are dressed, and a little bit uh, the, the B. Uh, shows meditators engaging in compassion meditations. Many areas of the brain are strongly activated. Those are area with a sense of affiliation, empathy, what I mentioned before, positive effect. On the right side, you know, C is the novices at rest, nothing happened. D is novices in meditation, nothing happened either. That's normal, they didn't train. You might say, well, great for you, 60,000 hours of meditation. What about us? Hence the 10 second meditation of our my dear friend Meng. You know, who can say they don't have 10 seconds every hour? So stop everything. Don't hug people, you might get a little bit in trouble. But just think for 10 seconds, may they be happy, may they flourish in life. And so if you do that, it sort of set up a stream. Actually, if you do not necessarily 10 seconds, but 20 minutes a day for four weeks of mindfulness meditation, and now I think I'm sure you get even better with caring mindfulness, you can see a structural change in the brain, in the hippocampus, which is an area of the brain that assimilates novelty when you train into something new, whether it's playing chess or juggling or mindfulness or altruistic love, your brain does change. It also changes your prosocial behavior. That's two weeks of compassion meditation. And you see the prosocial behavior, the blue sort of stack is much higher than any other psychological intervention. And at the same time, those who are with this increased prosocial behavior, they also found a decrease in the size after two weeks of the amygdala, which is area of the brain related to fear and anger. So that's quite remarkable. So don't be discouraged. Not only 10 seconds, but 20 minutes a day does make a difference very fast. You could even do that with preschoolers, four or five years old. And you do some kind of mindful breathing, you see, with that little stone. But there's a 10 week program that Richard Davidson did also in Madison, 40 minutes, three times a week. Very simple intervention about gratitude, emotional intelligence, empathy, feeling what the other feels, and all kinds of cooperative learning. I mean, I cannot describe in detail, there's a nice manual about that. But the fact is, 
that even this simple intervention with four or five years old leads to a significant increase in prosocial behavior. That's the blue line compared to a control group. But then comes the ultimate scientific test, the stickers test. And that's <laughs> unforgiving. So what you do, you determine before the intervention for each child in the class who is their best friend. And then that's the first photo you see on the left. And then the child they cannot stand. And then you have a two other envelopes with a photo of, or an image of an unknown child and a sick child. And before the intervention, you give them a bunch of stickers and say, please give it to anyone you want. So what happens? They give to their best friend almost everything. Now, 10 weeks later, you will say, well, you know, this is four or five years old. It's kind of a playful intervention, no big deal. They get a good time. But how can it change this in-group, out-group sort of discrimination? Well, it changed in a big way. It levels down. They give practically as much stickers as their best friend and their the least favorite child. So if you think of the deleterious effect in society of discrimination, whether it's racist, ethnical, religious, social class, if you could sort of level this in a simple way with young children, what a service to society. So we do that in India. We have 25,000 kids in the school that we build with Karuna Sechen. So we introduced yoga class, meditation class. And one thing for sure, it increased the attendance to school. Now, is there other good news that the possibility of so, so, in societal way? So we always speak about violence you know, everywhere. You know, in Marseille, in south of France, you can buy Kalashnikov for 800 euros almost everywhere. I mean, here, of course, it's much easier than in France. But still, what happens to violence over the centuries? So if you look at the book of Steven Pinker, there is a significant decrease in violence. No matter what violence is still there, and it was what you see on TV in Oxford in 1350, there was 100 homicides per year per 100,000 inhabitants. Now it's 0.6. You know, in Europe, it went down 50 to 100 times. In Australia, as soon as they banned personal arms, it went down 10 times. It's only Sicily that's about, it's about 12. We don't know why. I think there's a good study. It should be done there. In any case, basically, homicides have been going down steadily over the century. That's what the data said. If you look at to abolition of torture, and if you look at the average number of casualties per conflict all over the world, there are two data banks, one in the United States, one in Uppsala in Sweden. If you look at all the conflicts, of course, there are terrible things happening, you know, ISIS, you know, South Sudan, the Iraq, Iran war, million people died. But if you take all the conflicts worldwide, divide by the number of victims, it went from 50,000 average to 1,000. So there's always something somewhere terribly dramatic, but globally, it had gone down. If you, domestic violence is still the main cause of violence in the world because it's, it's one to one. But the abuse and violence against children in the United States has gone down by half in 20 years. So there is hope. Why is the hope? And how you could find the articulation point between individual change and societal change? Another great discovery I made while, while studying research for the book is the notion of evolution of cultures. Now, to get an altruistic gene, in every human being might take 50,000 years. It's too late for the environment. So evolution of culture is a Darwinian process that is faster than genes. There's actually a book called that, Faster Than Genes, which is a very good one. And the evolution of culture can happen over a generation. You know, our attitudes toward war, attitudes towards women, homophobia, environment, name it, culture are changing quite fast. You know, the slavery was abolished uh, in England in the 18th century. For, first of all, there were 10 people who said slavery is an abomination. Everybody laughed. The parliament said, there's no way. The British Empire will economically collapse without slavery. We can't afford that. 10 years later, it was abolished. Today, if you say, I, I'm against slavery, said people say, so what? And people who would say, how can you dare to say, no, it was not too bad. No, economically, it makes sense. Shall we put back slavery on? Shall we deny voting rights to women? Of course, we cannot go back on those cultural change, fortunately. So we made big progress of civilization. So that's why, you know, this was 10 people who decided to start that campaign. 10 people who had decided to promote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and they succeeded. 
So there can be tipping points, a critical mass of individual new ideas, and after a while, ethically, you can't feel comfortable if you still go you know, against women and men having the same sort of gender issue, having the same potential and possibilities and so forth. So that's why I think those two, individual change, societal change, being cumulative over generations, we don't have to learn again that slavery is terribly bad. You know, we're born in that sort of ideas and culture, sort of fashion each other like two knives sort of sharpening each other. So there's a possibility. So what can we do? I can go back to my hermitage. That's a, uh, was a very nice time. That's what I see in the morning. But we need to promote also caring economics. As I mentioned, that's the only way to remedy to poverty in the midst of plenty and take care of common goods, especially the environment. We need to uh, enhance cooperation within an enterprise. It has been shown again and again that a, a company, a community in which there's unconditional cooperation, transparency of information, of sharing, less sort of hierarchy that is you know, waterproof, is a company where it's better to work. And I think Google is a, probably a good example of that and therefore also more prosperous. It has been shown again and again that a company was nice to work also do better. And we need more cooperative learning instead of competitive one. There's many areas where we could boost our level of cooperation. We need no more sustainable development or growth. It's a bit suspicious. You, know, you always think of quantitative growth. We need qualitative growth. So instead of speaking of growth, why not speaking of harmony? For now, Sustainable harmony means reducing inequalities. There's still 1.5 billion people under the poverty line. That's not going to work well if you keep that. Inequalities are growing in all the OCD countries last 30 years. This is very unhealthy. Less trust is not harmonious. And then harmony for the future is to remain in harmony within the planetary boundaries so we can continue to prosper being in harmony with the environment instead of disrupting this equilibrium. So sustainable harmony, I think, is a powerful concept, and we should use it. We need local commitment. We need to do things ourselves. And global responsibility. We have the WHO takes care of epidemics and so forth. Nobody, no country can save. There's a plague epidemic. I'm not part of that. We have to be part of all things. Same thing for the environment. There should be global governance for the environment. There's no question. We need to be extend our altruism to 1.3 million species. No, we can't say they are just there for our use, for, our, for, you know, our distra for to distract us or to entertain us. To, they are our co-citizens in this world. They have a life. They are subject of a life. They don't want to suffer. That needs to be respected. The natural equilibrium needs to be respected. We are not the owner of 1.3 other billion species. We live with them in a very vast interdependent system. And we need Daring, we need to dare altruism. We need to dare that it does exist. We have a potential for it. We can teach it at school because there's a potential for that. Individually, we can change. Society can become more cooperative. We don't need to be afraid that it's a kind of lightweight concept. This is the core, most pragmatic answer to our times, uh, di different challenges. So in terms of animals, you know, we can say, as Bernard Shaw, that animals are my friend. I don't eat my friend. That is quite a good, nice way to explain why you don't want to eat fish in a restaurant. If they say, oh, you are vegetarian, so you eat fish, I say, well, look, everything that swims, everything that runs, everything that flies, they're all my friends. So then you can also do, say, like Martin Luther King, every man must decide, or man or woman, of course, whether he or she will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. It's up to us. So someone like the Dalai Lama shows us the path. We try to implement that in our humanitarian activities. You know, we have now developed 140 projects. This is one of our clinic. And we treat about 120,000 patients a year in Nepal, India, and Tibet. This is a clinic that we built in Bihar with the help of the Googlers here some years ago. It was a wonderful initiative. We built a school with bamboos in Nepal with a social entrepreneur, 2,000 kids in a school that we can build for $150,000. It's a good return on investment, all made with bamboo. So when there's an earthquake, it just moves a little bit. In Tibet, we built a number of dispensaries. Obviously, we need a bridge here. That's our car. <laughs> there's a road and there is a river. Nobody says, knows what, so the driver is resenting his mantra very fast. 
Uh, so we built 18 bridges, including one on the Yangtze, three on the Mekong. They all come from Tibet, by the way. We take care of the elderly. He is finally the happiest man in the world. <laughs> we got him, and the happiest woman is there as well. So we built a number of schools there, trying to favor especially education of girls. And we intervened in earthquake areas. First in Tibet in 2010, there was 10,000 people died there. So we brought a lot of goods. And this year, from April, we start building an earthquake resistance school at 12,000 feet in Tibet. It's a boarding school for children. In Nepal, as you know, the recent tragedy. So since we are uh, in the place with a clinic, 50 people strong, and a monastery with 500 disciplined monks, we could have teams going to the villages. And now, as I said, we help 40,000 people in 160 villages with food, with shelter, and basic medical necessity. And then we are going to move next to when the emergency is over, to community projects, rebuilding schools, rebuilding dispensary, wherever it's needed. This is our mascot, the Karuna girl. I photographed her 12, 12 years ago. You know the Steve Mercury Afghan girl, so I thought I should find her again. And so I found her, and I learned her name, and she's called Beautiful Ocean of Turquoise. So this is our website. It's very easy to see what we do and help us. And we are very grateful to Google to host me again and uh, also to have helped us in the past. And I know you continue to help us, of course. So thank you so much. And this was a few ideas. We still have, I think, 10 minutes or so to have question and answer before we break for the so-called meditation. Hi, thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about enlightenment and if that's uh, even a goal worth pursuing or if that's a selfish goal. Why? Can you tell us a little mm. bit more, please? Well, you know, that question often put to us, you know, well, you are well in your hermitage, you know, practicing compassion or mindfulness, whatever, ha, ha, ha. You know, is it not selfish to be in this nice place facing the Himalayas, not to have to think about paying taxes and things like that? Well, you know, I thought of it as, as far as, uh, you know, uh, my teachers and the tradition which I, I've been following for 45 years, one of the main goals is to get rid of selfishness while doing this practice. So you cannot accuse someone of being selfish. It's the goal, what he's doing now, is to get rid of selfishness. It's like saying to someone who's building a big hospital, what are you doing now with all this, uh, you know, construction work, plumbery, electricity, doesn't help anyone, go and do surgery in the street, you know. But of course, when the hospital is ready, it's so much more powerful. So I think mindfulness is not the ultimate essence of Buddhism. It's a tool. The you know, essence of Buddhism is wisdom and compassion. Now, to achieve that, if you're not mindful, you're just distracted. So therefore, you need whatever you do, whether it's activity in your workplace. You know, multitasking has been shown to be a very de uh, deficient way to do anything. They don't do anything better in cognitive tasks, including the speed of switching tasks, which would be the quintessence of multitasking. You just get a messy mind. So the idea of being concentrated, even you do many things in the morning, each time fully on what you do, is kind of the essence of mindfulness. Now, on a personal level, it also helps you to have a, a mind that is a little bit more clear, a little bit more stable, a little bit more calm, and that's also a better tool to then cultivate qualities like altruistic love and others. And also to, to, to deal with your hopes and fears and rumination. So it's basically a much more optimal and healthy state of mind that a confused, ruminating, torn apart, divided, conflicted mind, obviously. So I think it's a very beautiful and powerful tool. But again, since this is something that's become more, more and more popular, I think, and I mentioned that many times to my good friend John kabat please, you know, very explicitly include the caring aspect of it. Otherwise, it could be misused because any tool can be used for do harm or do good. And again, we don't want caring sniper, uh, mindful snipers. Mm -hmm. They are mindful, by the way, but they are not caring. So caring, I think, it makes, it just simply dispels all possible deviation. But otherwise, it's a very wonderful and powerful tool. This is secular, so nobody can argue that it's something that is not for us. The book is Altruism, available where books are sold. And my friends, Matthew Ricard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.